Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Ken and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. This is a missing persons broadcast. Friends, there are some true psychopaths in this world. Uh, so in the last, I don't know how many months since uh, Twitter has uh, been purchased, I uh, my Twitter crowd has grown exponentially. It's grown by over one third in just a short period of time. I have a little over, I think, 41,000 followers on Twitter. And Twitter isn't the space it used to be. I got to tell you, I get very little hate mail on it. Uh, it's a very, very sullen crowd that of individuals that are generally super polite. Well, a couple days ago, all of a sudden, my Twitter goes down. I know you post a couple of things a day there. David Politis at can -Am Missing for Twitter. And uh, it freezes up. I can't get on. I can't post. I can't do anything. I was uh, taking a long drive that day, so I didn't get to it till later that night. And I get back on it. I log out, come back on, do what they say to do to get the access again. And Twitter advises me that somebody hacked my account. Somebody from Georgia. They actually named the city in Georgia. And psychopath. <laughs> it's a psychopath. Who would do this? I'm a nobody in this world. There are people that have millions of followers. I don't have millions. It's just me. And some and some followers, big deal. Nutcase. Um, I'm lucky because I have a relative in the Secret Service, and the Secret Service is the ones that do all the investigations into hacking, stolen identity, and that's what that is. It's an identity theft issue. So I called him up, told him what I knew, and he said, Dave, we can file a subpoena against Twitter and within hours we'll know who this person is. And then you can, you and I will talk and see what you want to do. I said, okay. So, and I'm not gonna say a lot right now, but uh, I've had probably the same person and we will know soon if um, has tried to hack my emails as well. What's the point? Really, what's the point? I mean, you've got to be really some boring person to want to look into somebody else's or take control of somebody else's account. Apparently, this person took over my uh, Twitter account and sent some nasty Twitter messages to, to other people. And when I finally took control of the account, explained to everybody what happened and uh, people did say yeah they got some bad messages so and, I, and they said yeah we knew you wouldn't send it no I wouldn't I wouldn't do that but this fool did so for what it is now on the opposite end of the scale the other day uh, in the mail I got this letter it says uh, greetings Dave let me introduce myself to you. My name is Mark, and I'm an American living in Finland with my Finnish wife and our four kids. My wife and I met on a Christian dating website, and it was a fairy tale romance. We lived in Niagara Falls for a few years and then had a wonderful opportunity to move to Finland. That was 16 years ago. Some of my friends thought I was crazy to leave the States, but I love adventure, culture, and travel, and I could not miss the opportunity for myself and my family. Finland is an amazing place to live. Everywhere you go, there are gorgeous forests, lakes, and stunning natural beauty. You can see deer and moose at any time, and wild reindeer in Lapland in northern Finland. There's so much opportunity and support here for success in your life. It can be achieved if you're driven and a hard worker and honest in all your endeavors. Let me say this. Back in my days of coaching hockey and being around Ben and his hockey people, I met a lot of Finnish hockey players, just like he said, salt of the earth, great people. 
I would say I'm living in the American dream in Finland. My wife and I own a coffee house business called Volkoinen Poo, P U U, Volkoinen Poo, which means the white tree inspired by a tree in our home. It can be currently found in four cities throughout Finland. Our business operates in our own bakery, food factory, and guest house. Past three years have hit the food industry very hard, with many restaurants having to close. We pivoted quickly and through financial support by the Finnish government, we opened our food factory that produces our cafe quality lasagnas for several grocery markets throughout Finland. Our company has been founded on our strong Christian values and with purposeful thought. We use the best ingredients in our products. We support local businesses by sourcing from many local locations. All of our cakes and quiche are made with organic spelt. We believe in creating the best possible food. We always, hope, we always hope to inspire people with what we do. It starts first with our vision and then the respectful treatment of our employees. I would like to share some amazing opportunities that have blessed our company through our hard work in creating a brand that customers enjoy. We've had the opportunity to be on Finland's top bakery show in 2014 thanks to a customer who nominated us. Of course, I must also mention in addition to the cafes, we also create and produce, sell our own ceramics for our cafes to use for our customers. I want to thank you, Dave, for our service to humanity to get this truth out, bringing awareness to the people gone missing in national parks and forests. I recently bought all your books, two DVDs, and other goodies from the shop. Your movies are great, and we have watched them all the time. If you have any listeners traveling to Finland, they are welcome to come and experience the lovely, relaxing atmosphere in Vol Volkoinen Poo, cafes, or a book of stay in the peaceful guest house. Now, they sent me a very cool handmade cup with our favorite biped on it. And then they also sent us this sort of hot plate. It's really cool. It's got little cushions on the back, ceramic, with again, our favorite biped in three different places. Very well done. Very well done, Mark. And we have a lot of fans in, in Finland. And people may say, well, Dave, it's kind of like buying your time. Well, no, he didn't buy my time. He didn't give me any money. He sent a nice gift. And when people are supporting us, I'm going to support them. So if I'm ever in Finland, I guarantee I'm going to that their coffee shops and <laughs> have some of that stuff. But uh, there's a lot of nice people in the world. And when people work hard and build a business like that, I respect that. It's just me. Okay. Now the first, first note caught me by surprise. See if you guys have experienced this as well. It says, Dave, Facebook won't let me share your channel shows. It says use of your URL goes against community standards. What the heck? This is a new one for me, Michelle in Boston. You guys ever had that happen? First time I've ever heard that. Okay, next one. On three of my email accounts, we have several email accounts for shipping, for all kinds of things. But um, I'm going to read this to you because I don't want you to be a victim of this. My name is blah, blah, blah. I'm from Syria. I'm interested in buying properties and other investment in your country through your assistance if you can help me. I would like to learn more about your country's culture and other interesting lucrative business in your country. I would like more information about these projects so I can learn more about the investment project in your country and clarify your plan. I was a businesswoman in Aleppo before the Civil War. My business has been destroyed by the war. Our economy has collapsed. I want my daughter to immigrate to your country, but not as a refugee, rather as an investor, as I still have a substantial part of my cash holdings intact in a bank. So stop right there. I dealt with this as a law enforcement officer back in the day. And I know still a lot of innocent people get victimized by these things. If you get an inquiring email from anybody asking you to do anything, 
be cautious. Never, never pull money out of the bank for anybody. I don't care what they say unless you know them personally. Um, there's so many scams out there. You know, help, I'm in a foreign country. Please help me. I need some money. Uh, whatever. No, don't do it ever. Period. Okay? Okay, so the, the email, I'm sorry, the um, video I posted just prior to this was a factual news segment with a proposal for a new fiction book that I wanted to run by you guys. And I know a lot of people don't want to watch the factual news, but you really needed to watch this uh, book proposal I put. This is about that. Today's factual news was epic and spot on, Dave. Americans are being deceived, plundered, and set up for something we probably can't even imagine. Thanks again for all you do. Keep up that stellar work. I've never written a fictional book, but I'm telling you that you need to watch that. And I know a lot of people don't want to delve into politics. This isn't political. The factual news is not political. And that segment, the one I just did and posted, deals with the Chinese army training in Canada. It was confirmed, reaffirmed by Canada itself. And I had some friends that uh, we were visiting with who were Canadians who also confirmed it. So. But the fictional book you're gonna find interesting. Next letter. Hey Dave, I've been watching Missing 411 since I was since 2018. My sympathies to you and your family over the loss of Ben. My fascination about missing people started with watching the history channels Vanished. I was the executive producer of Vanished. You can watch it on Amazon. And then the movie Missing 411. Even though I haven't gone through the pain of losing a son, I do know the pain of losing loved ones. I've lost in a short period of time three members of my family. The first loss was my dad, and then about a year later, my oldest brother, then exactly a year and two weeks, my mom, who passed in 2017. Since 2021, my husband has been battling stage four colon cancer. I've been asked many times, how do I continue on with all that's happened? I'm not sure how I do it, but I know life goes on, and I take it day by day. I say a little prayer as well as for guidance, being surrounded with love from family, friends, and a special companion that does not speak, but shows unconditional love in her unique ways by purring and just being there when I need an outlet for relaxation and comfort. Ever since I've been a little girl, I've experienced or witnessed things I can't explain other than quite simply, I have witnessed UFOs and paranormal activity. My first experience was when I was nine or 10 with a UFO. It was a cold winter night. I remember looking out my bedroom window and seeing frost on it. We lived in an apartment on the second floor. My bedroom faced the street and across from us was a senior complex. There was a forest behind the complex. As I was sleeping, my room became suddenly bright with a light that shone in my bedroom. Confused, I got up to take a look outside my window. There shining through the trees was a big round light. It was as big as the full moon, but it was shining bright and moving slowly from left to right. As I watched it, I didn't feel scared, just curious as to what I was seeing. Then suddenly, as if someone had turned the light switch off, it disappeared. It was some years later that I talked about it, or what I saw that night to my family. I didn't care if they believed me. What I experienced, all I know what I saw. Just curious if you get any information about UFO sightings in central and northern Alberta. Please give Huck a belly rub for me and for my beautiful fur baby, Montana, who watches Missing 411 with me. Thanks, Dave. Take care of your time. Hey, Montana. Little scratch. Yeah, Huck, that spoiled little brat dog. No, just kidding. She gets more belly rubs than any 10 dogs you probably know. Today, uh, so last night it snowed about six inches here. And Huck is the happiest dog in the world. 
when you let her bound around in fresh snow. She'll run around and it's like her the bottom of her mouth is a shovel and she'll just scoop the fresh snow into her mouth and they just run like a wild woman. And uh, it's quite a sight. <laughs> uh, next letter. Hey Dave, you recently asked folks to tell their about their experiences with orbs. Three months ago I woke up at 4 a.m. very restless. There was an orb on my bedroom wall glowing green and blue. It changed from green to blue every 20 seconds. It's about the size of a softball. I could see shapes and shadows passing in front of the orb. It kept changing back and forth from green to blue for maybe 20 minutes. It disappeared all of a sudden. It did not give me a sense of fear. It was just there. It stayed in the same spot the whole time. I was frozen in amazement. It never occurred to me to grab my phone and try to record it. I've seen all kinds of weird stuff for years inside the house and outside. Much more than just orbs are out there, but you already know that. Thank you for all your hard work and research into many things going on around us that we don't know much about. I did a search into blue and green orbs. All I got was some new age explanation that made my head spin. My name is Ben. I'm disabled and I have lots of look into these weird, lots of time to look into these weird things. I've had many experiences that they call sleep paralysis. Pretty sure it's not what my doctor told me it was. Jesus has delivered me from evil spirits. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Ben. Next one. Hey, Dave. Name is Steven, and I live in South Carolina. I've been an avid fan of your videos, docs, and books. I just finished your first two books, and I have a question for you about that deals with prescri prescribed burns. Unless I've missed it in one of your videos or books, please correct me if I'm wrong, you have not mentioned anything about the National Parks of Forest conducting controlled burns that have disappearances. 100% correct. Here in South Carolina, I know a lot of controlled burns take place in our national forest. I've looked into disappearances here in my area and I've been unsuccessful in finding any in our forest. If you know of any that take place in the Francis Marion National Forest, I'd like to know, do you have any research that has controlled burns as a variable? No and no. Thank you for everything that you do. I wish your work got the spotlight more. I look forward to hearing from you. I wish your work had the spotlight more. You know, we talk about this a lot. For work that just cites facts with no theories, with no wild outlandish claims. It's kind of surprising, isn't it? No, no media. Uh, nobody wants to touch it. But you got to remember something. Media isn't what it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. There are really no more investigative journalists. There's nobody doing hard hitting journalism anymore. So stories like mine are going to be touched on in media such as you're watching right now. But as far as mainstream media, no. The only other thing you're going to have is everybody in the world copying the cases that we research and talk about. And that is pretty frustrating. Okay. Hey, Dave. Just watching my Bigfoot lesson in the stories from Pennsylvania. Wow, I was reminded of something I saw a year ago, but never talked about because nobody wants to listen. Ha ha, you're the lucky one. It was early September, about 2 p.m. I was sitting in my living room watching TV when I heard what sounded like a car backfiring. We also have quite a few knuckleheads that think making a big noise with their bikes and autos makes them look cool. Anyhow, it caught my attention. In front of me was our big picture window facing the street. So I stood up to see what I could see. The noise was louder than usual and kind of different. I yelled at my husband, John, who was lying on the couch to get up. Come look at this. He mumbled something. Dave, about 30 round glowing gold balls were rolling down the street. They were the size of soccer balls. The gold emitted light that seemed to streak behind them as they rolled as one might depict movement in a drawing. 
The balls made no sound and hovered just above the asphalt, moving, rolling fast. One kind of bounced, becoming separated from the rest, and after two more bounces, bounced off into the far side of my yard. The entire episode lasted mere seconds, although watching them, I felt like time stood still. I was fixated and couldn't move, not even to reach down and grab my phone from the end table to take a photo. I then rushed out to find one that had bounced into my yard. The only sign that something could have done that was some slightly crushed bent foliage that borders the street where there's no sidewalk, but no gold ball. My street is long and I have a clear view down to the end, but saw nothing. Judging on their speed, I think they would have been rolling still near the end. Well, that's it. I'm the only one who saw it. I reported it to MUFON and a few days later got a call from a guy following up on my report. He says it wasn't ball lightning, but had no idea what it was. A real huh moment. I love your channel, Dave. Keep on doing what you're doing. You do it so well. Give me give Huck a pat on the head and a belly rub. <laughs> give Huck a pat on the head and a nice belly rub for Angie. Ha ha. <laughs> Take care. Funny. So uh, you are going to be the first ones to hear this. Uh... Everybody knows I've been a MUFON investigator for 21 years. And uh, I've had a lot of articles published in their newsletter. Well, I'm going to be one of those keynote speakers at their World Symposium in Cincinnati this year. And if you just Google MUFON, M-U-F-O-N, Symposium, you'll get to their page. And it's in Cincinnati. It's a big deal. And uh, I've spoken at one other one maybe four or five years ago. This one's going to be big when I talk about it. And I'm going to talk a lot about the movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. So uh, I'm excited about it. It's one of those conferences that is exceptionally well done. And I like it because there are tons of super smart people in the audience. Uh, last time I was there, I think the entire front row, there, there's between 600 and 1,000 people there. The entire front row, I knew a lot of them, and they were all PhDs, genius people, and they ask you great questions. So I enjoy it a lot, and uh, it will be a good time. It's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, I believe it's in July. I don't know. You got to look it up. But I'm giving you the early head start. Got to get there. You don't have to be a MUFON member to go. But there's a lot of good speakers. Next letter. Hey, Dave. I'm a 68 years old who lives in Evesham in Worcestershire, UK. I'm quite a new member of your village. Well, welcome aboard. You're amongst friendly folks but find your work very interesting and thought-provoking, as well as very sad for the loss of the victims as well as their poor families. The strange thing happened to me last November 2022. I was up at 6 a.m. as usual. <laughs> You're an early bird. And as I walked into the kitchen, I heard a local stray cat scratching on the back door. So I opened the door to give it some biscuits. Remember, it was November, freezing cold, pitch dark, and there was a storm with gale force winds on that particular morning. The only light was coming through my open door in the kitchen windows. As I bent down to put cat food on the cat bowl outside, I noticed a small rod, R-O-D, about the length of a credit card, but about a quarter of an inch thick in matte black in color floating about three feet above the ground. As I stood, as I stood up again, it was still there, but it was gliding to the right and I stopped after going about a foot. Somehow I felt it was watching me, so in my mind I said hello. Afterwards, it moved slightly left, then right again, and then moved off gliding to the left past the door and past the end of the house, and I lost it in the darkness of my backyard. The gale force winds didn't affect it at all, and the cat took no notice of it. That's weird. Have you ever heard of anyone else seeing something like this? Maybe they use these to spy on people. So they know when to take them. Who knows? 
Anyway, thank you very much for an interesting series of programs. Something odd is going on in this world. We need brave people like you to advertise it. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> I made a movie called Missing 411, The Hunted. Missing, and then the numbers 411, The Hunted. You can find it on iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo. And in there... I went to a place in the Sierra Nevada mountains that was a hunting camp for some men for over 45 years. Well, one time, one of the men who was not hunting, it was off season, took his wife up there. And it was Ron Moorhead. And Ron and his wife went to stay in camp for a week with nobody else. And as they were asleep in camp, It was like dusk and through camp they see about a three or four foot long rod just as was described here long and thin like a broomstick moving through camp very slowly Ron said that he couldn't believe it when he saw it and it was just one of the many things that he had seen in that camp over the years. He said it moved around trees, so it moved with thought and intent, intelligence. And then it went a short distance and they lost sight of it and it was gone. That was the only time in 45 years where the hunters had ever described something like that being seen. Now what I think is Interesting, why would there be rods and orbs? And then what's the difference between a rod and an orb? I've heard of orbs being anywhere from the size of golf balls to the size of medicine balls. So what's the difference? Is there a purpose? I don't know. But Ron's one of my best friends I trust, I trust what he says implicitly, and so that's the best I could give you. Next letter. Hey Dave, I've been meaning to write you for some time. I've been listening to you since you were on Art Bell and Coast to Coast. I've been watching your videos that long. I'm a multiple NDER, N-D-E-R, and have many experiences with UFOs. Two almost abductions by Grays as a child, and we'll share those uh, at another time. My father was an LAPD officer. He was a young cop during the Black Dahlia murders. He was a veteran of 10 years when I was born. Old school, he walked a beat in South Central. This is one of the main reasons I've listened to you as being part of a law enforcement family. My background is LDS, mother and Jewish father. Though I practiced being LDS for many years, currently I'm spiritual and blessed with many girls from my last NDA experience. I prefer, prefer the word intuitive rather than psychic. Blue Orb. The experience happened in June of 88. I was driving on the Santa Monica Freeway. That's the 10 westbound at Westwood. I was actually going to the LA Temple. I was driving a pickup truck with my girlfriend. Just past La Cienega off ramp. I could see Century City on my right. My girlfriend asked me, what is that? There was a blue orb on my left-hand side of the truck about six feet from my driver's window. It looked like a golf ball in the middle, about five or six feet across. The inner part looked like a golf ball with the divot, divots. The middle was gray and the outside was a royal blue. When I put my hand out the window, the orb was just out of reach. There was moderate traffic that day. I changed lanes and the orb went to the passenger side of the truck about the same distance. About this time, the area of the freeway, there was a hill on the right-hand side would block view of Century City. The orb was still following me. At some point, it switched to my side about the same distance. The orb was silent. I had turned off the radio, and there was only traffic noise on the freeway. Then it switched sides again, and it moved backwards and around it at a high rate of speed that created a light trail towards the area of Century City. City. Moments later, was my exit, and I went to my destination. I've been in lava tubes around Mount Shasta. I was with a group of six friends. A few of my friends took pictures of us at the tubes. 
there were many orbs of different colors around us in those tubes. I know about portals, granite, and have several experiences with Sasquatch at Mount Shasta. All the conversations were telepathic. I do not have a veil anymore after my last NDE, near-death experience. I have the ability to converse with angels, beings of light, and elemental beings, fairy kingdom. I agree with what was said about portals in the interview by your FBI friend. I share those experiences too. I wish your books were on Audible as I have a difficult time reading sometimes. During my last NDE, I had some brain trauma and my left and my life started over as an adult. It is easier to listen than to read. Thank you for your sharing. I've watched your current 411 missing video several times. I'm a professional videographer trained at a university TV station. I left a five-star review. Love and light. Thank you very much. If anybody has watched this on Amazon, Missing 411, The UFO Connection, or any of my movies on Amazon, I would be very blessed and pleased if you would go back and leave a review. Go back to your account on Amazon. Now, under your account, look at past purchases. Go to the purchase you made to watch it, and you can leave a review. Now, Audible Books. It's been a while since I said this. I'm not a big book publisher. I'm a nobody, really. But there's 10 big book publishers in the world that do 95% of all the Audible books. If I put an Audible book up for sale, within an hour, it'll be on 20 pirate sites offered for free. And then it would cost me tens of thousands of dollars in attorney fees to get them off those sites, which is why I don't do Audible books. Now, obviously, if I was one of those big publishers They've got a big staff of attorneys. It's not a big deal. Of course they'll do it. I can't do it. That's the reason for I can't do ebooks and I can't do audible books. Those are the reasons. Next letter. Hey Dave, thank you for your research and the honest talk about mental health. You're evolving the tragic and sorrowful loss of your son Ben into a meaningful message of hope that has impacted many lives, mine included. My heart is grieved with yours and I've cried when you couldn't hold back the tears. Continue to stand strong and know that you are loved and respected by villagers. Your message matters. Question. Have you heard of telepathic communication occurring in Bigfoot counters? Yes, I have. I'll attempt to relay my experience as briefly as possible about possibly walking into Bigfoot territory and what was communicated. Around 73, I was 11 years old and camping with my dad, mom, and brother in the endless mountains of Pennsylvania near Gibson, South Susquehanna. This was a very, very rural area at the time. The campground was rustic, just camping with no amenities for entertainment or special activities. My dad asked the campground owner about hiking. He told us there were no houses or farms for miles behind the campground. There were no hiking trails. He also said it wasn't a good idea to head into the forest and we should stay around the camp. My dad said he knew how to find his way in and out of the woods and later he and I went off for a hike. About a quarter mile in, we kept hearing a sharp whack like a gunshot but my dad said it was probably someone chopping wood. The sound got louder and louder the deeper we went in, and, which was odd since no one lived back there. I mentioned to my dad that I felt like we were being watched. He agreed and he said he felt the same way, but we kept going. About a mile in, the forest opened into a small clearing. We stopped and noticed that all the forest sounds had gone silent. No more birds singing, leaves rustling, no more of the whacking sound. I asked my dad why he thought it got so quiet. He said he didn't know. Next, we noticed that most of the young trees in the clearing had been taken down and set in a triangular pattern on the far side of a clearing in a way that formed kind of a wall. The tree stumps were all about three foot high and splintered and twisted. My dad pointed out that the trees were not cut down because the trees that's cut with an ax or a saw have fairly straight line cuts across the cut. The tree stumps and the ends of the trees looked like they'd been twisted and torn apart. I asked my dad how this could happen that maybe a storm had come through and torn them down. It didn't make sense to me at the time. Strangest of all were a couple of young trees that were suspended in the forks of other trees. One about 10 feet long, rested in a fork a good 20 feet off the ground. Second was about 15 feet long and balanced in a tree fork 10 feet above. The young tree was perfectly balanced in the fork with one end about six feet off the ground. 
The tree slowly teetered up and down a few times, then it came back to rest in a perfect balance. I said to my dad, the wind didn't do this. Someone put it there. Just then a sharp whack sounded nearby and startled us both, and we decided to leave. Heading out of the clearing, we stopped to look at something in the base of a large tree. Don't recall what it was or what caught our interest, because what happened next was terrifying. Small stones started flying around us. At first I thought it was acorns or walnuts falling out of the tree until a rock hit my dad and another about the size of a half dollar landed at my feet. He looked around but couldn't see anyone and quickly decided time to get out. The feeling of being watched was incredibly tense. I felt certain I would see someone standing back in that clearing if I turned around and my curiosity got the better of me. As I turned, I was startled by something unseen that screamed in a harsh guttural voice, leave now. I gasped and glanced back at my dad. He kept walking and didn't react. Obviously, he did not hear it. Then the voice said, you, will, you we will not harm, but him we will kill. Leave. Absolute terror gripped me. Started to cry and ran to my dad and grabbed his hand saying, hurry, don't turn around. We half ran, half walked out of those woods. As we pushed some distance between us and the clearing, we started hearing birds and normal forest sounds again. It was rough ground much of the way, but we barely slowed down enough to reach the dirt road that led back to the campground. Before we reached the camp, I told my dad that I'd heard and he believed me. Perhaps it was because my terror was real and perhaps it was because he knew I didn't make things up. I made my dad a promise we, we wouldn't go back in those woods again. I've heard Bigfoot accounts of wood knocking, tree structures, and rock throwing that leads me to think that we may have stumbled into their territory. But have you ever heard of any kind of telepathic communication? It is baffling to me, even though I was young. I don't believe I imagined it. If you get the opportunity to read this, I'd appreciate your insight and comments. Like some others that have written to you, I've had a number of unusual experiences over my lifetime, and perhaps another time I'll relay that tie that goes into your research. Thanks again, Dave, for your work and missing people in the associated books, videos, classes, etc. I've followed your work since your first appearance on Coast to Coast. Also, Missing 411, the UFO connection is excellent. I've watched it three times. What incredible work and a thought-provoking film. Kind regards and many blessings. Telepathic communication. Here's what I have to say about that. First of all, nobody can claim that they know for 100% fact where they're getting these communications from. Could it be Bigfoot? Sure. Could it be demons? Sure. Could it be aliens? Sure. Could it be something else? Sure. So when people say, oh, I got a telepathic communication from Bigfoot, I always question that. And I'm not calling them liars. I'm questioning how they know it came from a Bigfoot. How can they be sure? That's all. But if it was me, and it got quiet like that. I've told you what I've done before. It's only happened to me once with uh, another man much more experienced in the woods than me. And we sat on the other side of a giant Douglas fir tree for about 20 minutes until the sound came back. Then we left. And we were armed to the hilt that day. But very strange. So three missing persons cases today. And I got to tell you, that they're unusual and that they concern me because the stories you're going to see why I'm saying that. But first, I'm going to read this to you. While I was doing research on missing people, I came across this. It says, Hunters Find Missing Link, April 14th, 1909. They claim they shot a beast that walked like a man. Mexico City, April 14th, Dateline. What the Tutaloma in the Altar District look upon as a missing link between man and the anthropoid ape has just been discovered by two vaqueros and claimed to have killed the monstrosity in self-defense while hunting. Indians who have seen the carcass of the beast identify it as a traditional Nahua 
or Aztec beast. The animal is the size of a large dog and without hair except on the top of the head and the tip of the tail. Its complexion is not unlike that of a dark Indian, while its skin is wrinkled and roughened like that of a one long exposed to the weather. The hair on the animal's head is a distinct auburn and bristles out in a shock like that of one being unacquainted with a comb or a brush. <laughs> the rear feet upon which it walked when discovered are like those of a human being, except for nails like bear's claws. Its front feet are like those of a dog. The mouth is like that of a dog, but the face is hairless like that of a monkey. I've read a lot of stories. I've never, ever read something like that. April 14th, 1909, Hunters Find Missing Link. I thought you'd enjoy that because that was weird. Now, first story has to do with a young boy that disappeared. His name was Johnny Jennings. He was 13, missing December 1st, 1920, from Smithfield, Illinois. And he lived with his parents. And the boy was described as different. And when I, the more research I did on it, sounds like he was probably somewhat autistic. Not really, really bad, but just a little. The boy was functional enough that he ran trap lines for animals along and near the Spoon River in southern Illinois. On December 1st, he told his folks that he was going to go out and check his trap lines and be back by dinner. Well, he went out and he didn't come back. Let me explain where this happened. So, this is St. Louis right here. This is the Mississippi River. And this is the Illinois River. And the Spoon River runs right in the middle of this area. His residence was right here. He was last seen near Macomb, Illinois. These are orange dots right here. Three right here, one right here, are missing persons cases I've written about before. So, that, friends, is a cluster. Well, when he didn't come home, his brother and his mom and dad immediately went out and looked in the middle of the night, calling his name, went to the spots, came back, got relatives and friends on December 2nd to go out and look, about 30 of them. The next day, they got 100 people. On December 3rd and they got somebody that had trained bloodhounds well the bloodhound actually tracked Johnny 12 miles and he was wearing a duck coat and white gloves and he was this is a key point he was traveling with a small dog based on the direction he was initially going his parents thought well maybe he got done checking his trap lines because he was somewhat walking in the direction of his sister's house. But then the trackers said that he made an, an abrupt turn away from the sister's house. And where the turn happened was outside of Macomb, Illinois. And the, the dogs just stopped. It's like the track stopped in the middle of nowhere, disappeared. Now they went back and they interviewed different people and when he was seen near Macomb, people said that the dog was still with him. Parents were interviewed and said that there's no way he'd ever run away. He loved his parents, loved his brother, loved his life, didn't have any problems. A local sheriff investigated, validated he had a great house. People loved him. And the family was devastated and perplexed because of the sudden stop of the dog. Now it is between two major rivers, and if you count the Spoon River, that's three. And if you realize there's four missing persons cases from this area, pretty strange. 
Now they did say that Johnny knew this area very well and he they didn't think he'd get lost. Uh, he had ran the track lines by himself for a number of years and he knew the way to his sister's house. So the sudden change in direction didn't make sense to them and then the sudden stopping of the scent trail didn't make sense. So they went back and they searched many times over the following year and they searched even the following year. Nothing was ever found. Johnny Jennings literally disappeared. Scent trail and everything. Very odd. Very odd. Now the next case is from the United Kingdom. And in fact tonight I'm going to give you three cases from three different countries. How's that? The UK, and this case is from what's called the Island or the Isle of Skye, S-K-Y-E. It's two individuals. One person named Stanley Moore, 25, and he was hiking with his fiancée named Barbara Nicholson, who was 23. They went missing on May 16, 1935. Now this is the Isle of Skye. They were staying at a location here in Broadford and they were going to hike into the Cullen Hills. Hold that thought. Now Stanley was a railway booking clerk at Penrith and Barbara was also from Penrith and they were engaged. It was stated that they loved each other immensely. They were looking forward to getting married and they thought that taking this hike would be a good, clean way to have fun and see the countryside. Well, they left Broadford and they were supposed to be back in two days and they weren't back. So immediately some people from the city went out looking for them. Well, three days after they disappeared, Barbara's body was found laying over a boulder adjacent to a creek and a small waterfall. Now, while Barbara and Stanley were gone, strangely, it snowed a lot. Now, Barbara's body was found over a boulder with no shoes, no stockings, and a small wound on her head. And her skirt was on the opposite side of the creek. Hmm. Now, you have to think of the time on this. Now, if people were going to take a four or five mile hike, nowadays you wouldn't be in a skirt with stockings. But back in the day, that's the way you hiked. So not having stockings, not having your skirt on, mm-mm doesn't make any sense. And to be in close, pro close proximity to the body, if the allegations were that she was in the creek and she got washed down somehow, then all of these things being in close to the body wouldn't make sense. They'd be all over the valley based on a high creek, let's say. But she's found and there was no cause of death. But they're still looking for Stanley. So the searchers pushed on. They went as far back as six miles where they found Barbara and they hiked another two miles and covered the radius around her body looking for him. Now you got to remember these islands there don't have a ton of big cover like you see in national forests in the US. A lot of rolling meadows, some some scrub but that's about it and they weren't finding Stanley which was troubling hundreds of people including the parents of Barbara and Stanley responded and searched this area now strangely in a in coupled with these articles over the weeks that this went on 
there was a story about prophecy. And a couple years before this happened, a man was on his deathbed and he made a prophecy that said that two people in this exact area where Barbara was found would go missing and they would both die. And these articles made a big deal about this story and this man's death and how he had this vision, they called it a prophecy. It seemed like everybody in the UK believed it because they kept printing the story. So the people in the city and from uh, Barbara and Stanley City kept pushing on, looking for Stanley. It didn't make sense. He should have been found. He was never found. There were multiple searches going back months looking for his body. Never found. That makes zero sense. And considering Barbara's essentially found almost naked, that's very odd. Really odd. So you have a situation where she's found next to water. You have point of separation between her and Stanley. You have missing clothes. And you have them being on an island surrounded by water. Question comes back and was posed in the article. Could she, and they push this theory hard, is that she was looking for help coming back to the city after he was injured. I have, I read these, I read dozens of articles. I have no idea where they came up with this. There's no evidence that this has happened. There's no evidence that they, that she was looking for help. There's no evidence that he was injured. I said, man, that, that's a complete break in logic to think all this. But the articles went on to say it. Long and the short of it is, it's quite a mystery. How Barbara died, because I searched and I couldn't find a reason. And it's quite a mystery why her shoes, clothes, were all off her body. I don't understand that one either. That was Huck saying hi. So I'll let you have a look at it again. From Broadford, where they started their hike, to where her body was found in the Cullen Hills, is six miles. And that's the area that they searched for Stanley, never found. Island of Sky, or Isle of Sky. Next case involved a man by the name of Edwin Exton, British Columbia, Canada. He went missing June 18th, 1928. He lived in England and he was visiting the uh, British Columbia. He was from Faversham and he had come to America with a friend of his that he had fought in the Great War with. And they were buddies. And they were staying together at a local establishment when Edwin said he wanted to hike up this one creek and just see what was up there, get some exercise. And his friend said that he was going to stay in and wait for him to come back. It was just going to be a one day hike up and he'd come back. This was near Powell River, British Columbia. And Edwin was hiking up a creek called Suicide Creek. This area has many, many missing people. Give me the map. So this is Vancouver, BC. Suicide Creek is up here right near Powell River. This area right here has tons of missing people Many I've presented to you on this channel right here. Suicide Creek. Well, his friend reports him missing to the RCMP after a friend and another friend searched for him for a while. And the first team that was sent to go up there was a provincial constable for the RCMP named A.J. Butler. 
He brought along a man named I.L. Tingle, and Edwin's friend was a man named S. Harrison. So they made their way seven miles up Suicide Creek, and they get to a giant log that's crossing the creek. And as they're stepping over the log, they find a pair of shoes sitting there. And Harrison said, uh, those are Edwin's shoes, I think. Well, that, that was bad. So they search the area. They don't find anything. They come back. So A.J. Butler, the provincial constable, gets more help. He says, something odd is going on. We're going back in there. So they went back in again, searched a wider area, didn't find anything. Butler and Tingle led searches into that area for the next two weeks, trying to find where Edwin was and couldn't find him. Couldn't find anything else to show that he was even there. And they gave up. They called Edwin's parents in the UK. They explained that he went missing, couldn't be found. Parents were devastated. Now here's what I want you to think about on this. Why would somebody take off their shoes in a creek in June? It's not a hard thing to understand. Let's pretend for a while. Say you're not used to hiking, got a pair of shoes, you hike seven miles up, feet kind of hurt, got a beautiful creek there, take your shoes off, rest your toes and your feet in the creek, makes complete sense to me. But, <laughs> big but here, I am not walking into the woods without shoes. Sorry, that dog don't hunt. And I don't think Edwin walked off into the woods without shoes. Because most people who don't normally walk in bare feet aren't walking far in the woods in bare feet. Stickers, rocks, a lot of things could cut your feet and hurt your feet. I don't think he would leave without them. Let alone get very far without them. So the million dollar question is, where did Edwin go without shoes? And it's another one of those cases where water played a big role in this. His shoes are found right next to Suicide Creek. He's gone. No evidence where he went. Yeah, I call it strange. And when I read this right away, it hit me as odd. Sorry, just me. It does fit the profile, of course, and it's in a cluster of missing people in this part of British Columbia. That area of southern British Columbia has multiple, multiple clusters of missing people. Not only is Suicide Creek close, or is a body of water, but it's also close to the Pacific Ocean as well. The Strait of Georgia, which is right here, this is all the Pacific Ocean on this side of the island. This is Vancouver Island right here. Big giant island off the coast. And all of this area, going all the way this way, tons of missing people. The area kind of reminds me a little bit of Pennsylvania in that sense with the numbers of missing people. And you know, the more time, this is a brand new case. No one's ever heard of it. Edwin Exton, Stanley Moore, Johnny Jennings. These are all brand new cases. Not in any book, brand new. The more I dig into British Columbia, the more I realize how many cases there must be that we don't even know about. And the surprising thing to me is, and I keep having to remind myself of this, 
even if somebody did disappear under strange circumstances, we should be finding more than what we're finding. Now, in Barbara's case, we found her clothing and we even found her. <clears throat> we never found Stanley. We found Edwin's shoes. We've talked about shoes before. What is it about shoes? Well, to me, it's two things. You're not gonna travel far without shoes. And shoes are the one thing on your body that probably have the most bacteria on them. Just saying. Well, in the meantime, those are our three cases for today. I hope you found them interesting. And I really appreciate the people that wrote the letters. They were very intriguing. First of all, if you like the video, can you give it a thumbs up? Make sure you're subscribed to our channel. I've gotten a lot of complaints lately with people being unsubscribed. You can follow me at Twitter at can I'm missing at David Politis. And right below this, the comment section, there'll be a pinned comment up there. I'll put it up the morning this goes up. I appreciate each of you. you you've been a great, great team here in putting up comments and interesting thoughts. So thanks. In the meantime, be be nice to your neighbor, be nice to your community. Doesn't cost you a thing. Smile, see somebody that needs help, open a door, make a kind gesture, say something nice to people. A lot of people out there are lonely these days. Anything we can do to perk them up. Missing 411, the UFO connection. If you watched it, please leave a comment or a review. If you've watched any of my movies on Amazon, please leave a review. It would be appreciated. Thanks for being here. Politis out.